it seems to me that we're at a, an amazing global political moment, maybe the biggest political moment in 50 years. And one of the Barack Obama <laughs> lessons that we can all draw is the, his famous phrase, if not now, when? And it seems to me that this is the moment for reform, reform globally, but also reform at home and reform in the foreign assistance program itself. It's, uh, it's not later, it's now when we need to do this. The U.S. has become a polarizing force in the world instead of what it has traditionally been, which is a force for reconciliation and leadership. So there's a need for a new face for America in this business of development cooperation, but more broadly, obviously. So it's a political moment which requires, in my judgment, political leadership for this new era of international cooperation when the U.S. seeks to redefine its role in the world and restore trust in America once again. So I have figured out four C's uh, for policy leadership and for people leadership for this new era. <coughs> the policy leadership dimensions are international coordination with not only the OECD donors, but the multilateral donors and the new non-DAC donors in the world a, to replace the sort of fragmented and competitive uh, and even confrontational system that we've had up into in, of, re, of late. The second policy piece of this is policy coherence, something that other nations, other industrial nations do well, we have done hardly at all, as the administrators would, I'm sure, testify, where you integrate across trade, finance, debt, and even energy, health, education, <coughs> climate, and other things, the various instruments of American development cooperation that impact on the rest of the world in, in an effort to make a more coherent impact rather than give with one hand and take away with the other. The people dimensions of leadership, it seems to me, are intensive consultation with Congress and a new effort to capacitate the development cooperation effort in a different way by mobilizing private sector leadership and civil society leadership. The link between the policy leadership piece of this and the people leadership part, it seems to me, has to have some content. And that is what the U.S. is doing in the world needs to be consistent with, in the American mind especially, with what we're trying to do at home. The American people clearly want improvements in health, education, equality, opportunity, environmental balance. These, in a way, are the Millennium Development Goals, in fact. And it seems to me that it's not a stretch to say that the Millennium Development Goals echo the aspirations of the American people, not only for what the condition they wish for themselves in the next era, but the conditions that they wish for others in the world so that they can be comfortable in it. So the M MDGs, at least potentially, I think, I think in fact, but I admit that there could be other formulations, that the MDGs pose an, a vital link of content between domestic priorities and concerns of the American people on the one hand and the kinds of efforts that we need to make abroad on the other. And without that, intensive cons consultation with Congress doesn't really make a lot of sense because the whole, the whole point is not to just have more consultation and more coordination. The question is about what? What are we trying to get done? So I think the reform era requires political leadership. So I join the administrators and many of others of you in the room and others outside in thinking that a secretary for global development is an answer to this particular global moment, this global political moment, and this moment for reform. So there are a couple of other Barack Obama lessons that come to play here. One is what I call the Hillary effect. The Hillary effect is that you name somebody who's already a recognized leader to lead the, the effort rather than somebody who becomes recognized because you've chosen them as a leader. You take a less journeyman approach to this than you do really thinking about who's the best and most the, the, the leader who could have the most visibility and the most impact to uh, carry forward such an effort. The second, or the third, in fact, Barack Obama lesson is that you take a team approach to leadership rather than try to think about a single leader. If you look at what the president-elect has done with the national security team and the economic team, I mean, it's clear that four is better than one and that he's not lodging the leadership in a single person, but in a team, in a group, all of whom are distinguished. So I think it's a time to think big and to think bold in this, in this endeavor. 
So who, what kinds of people do I have in mind? What does this mean to have a new era of global cooperation based on these vectors of policy <coughs> leadership and public leadership? Well, just imagine a world in which the donor coordination functions of the United States are led by a person such as Jim Wolfenson or even Bob Zellick. Think about what kind of a world we would have if the if the policy coherence elements of the drawing together the different threads of American development cooperation ever were led by the likes of Wesley Clark or Colin Powell or even David Gergen. Think of what it might be like if we had the, the congressional relations in the hands of someone like Lee Hamilton or Jim Leach. Think of what would happen if we had the capacitation efforts, the mobilization of the private sector and the civil society in the hands of someone like Senator Chuck Hagel or Bill Gates. Now, I'm not suggesting that we have a debate here about whether these particular people are the people we want, but rather encouraging you to think of people like them that we might think about to take on leadership segments of the development, of development cooperation effort so that there's actually a team of people that approach this. We haven't lodged all our hopes and all the world's hopes in a single person, but in a team of people who are able to uh, bring this off. I, so I'm encouraging you to think also about flexible modalities in which people of this stature, of this leadership capability, of this luster, could be involved in the development cooperation, the U.S. development cooperation of the future. I mean, think about the fact that Paul Volcker is is one of the most distinguished economists that, that Barack Obama has drawn on. He has a fairly informal role, which I'm sure will be intensive in some moments and less intensive in others. But he's involved. His name is there. People can have confidence because of it. I think about Susan Rice having been just appointed as uh, cabinet-level <coughs> ambassador to the United Nations. In the short run, wouldn't it make sense to have a cabinet secretary for development cooperation or a cabinet secretary for global development who has cabinet level position even though we haven't yet gone through the tedious business of putting a cabinet level department under him or her. So I think there are, that we need to think flexibly and think boldly and think big at this moment. It matters a great deal that we turn the corner now on this. It, the fact that there are internal bureaucratic reasons that people can give why we should and shouldn't do things really needs to be set aside to realize that this moment in American history, the American people, and maybe more importantly, the people of the world expect a lot of us now. And we need to do it. We need to exercise political leadership with political leaders. And we need to do it now.